So I'm here at the Ethereum house in the wee hours of the last day of the Bitcoin conference of Miami. And um, joining me is uh, Charles Hoskinson and Vitalik Buterin, two of the five core developers for the Ethereum project. So guys, thanks for uh, inviting me in, your hospitality, and talking today. Oh, it's a pleasure to be with you. It's been a long day. So there's a pretty big presentation for Ethereum at the conference. Can you talk a little more about that? Well, yeah, it was a very large conference and incredibly exciting. Uh, I think it was over a thousand people who attended. Many uh, easily, yeah, many wonderful companies. It really surprised me to see how much the conference scene has grown from 2013 to 2014. And yeah, Vitalik had a, a really wonderful presentation. Vitalik, would you want to talk about that? Yeah, sure. So I had a 30-minute presentation. I basically talked about what if, what Ethereum is, uh, what some of the applications are, why we need it. And I think like the reception was really amazing. Like I saw in the presentation just before mine, you know, 40% of the seats were filled. During mine, it went up to 80%. After mine, it went back down to 50%. I well, think that was, means something. Oh, it, was, it was amazing. In fact, <laughs> he, he said any questions, every hand went up and he yeah. answered one. And then the moderator said, you have to go, you have to go. So he went outside and like everybody left the room. And they just mobbed him like a Van Halen yeah. concert. It, it was, was like crazy. four or five people deep. It was pretty intense. It, it was. And I said, oh, God, I'm sorry, Vitalik. Where I have to come save you. I couldn't. I, I, I'm pretty tall, so I can see people, and I right. couldn't even see his head in the sea of people. Yeah, we got a picture of it actually. So, what was that like? Uh, I just sort of stared at the front, at the first three people, and I just concentrated on whatever their questions were. And basically, it's like a video game. You know, you got a, you got a hundred monsters. You just you sort of slay them one by one. <laughs> <laughs> So what, uh, what is Ethereum? You know, I- uh, Ethereum is really a project of frustration. What happened with master coin, color coins, uh, bit shares, many of these other projects is they all have this desire to build interesting things either on top of Bitcoin or apart from Bitcoin, like smart contracts, smart property, decentralized autonomous organizations, decentralized exchange, <laughs> name coin stuff, identity management stuff, these, these kinds of things. So far, the results we've seen have yielded a lot of isolation, fragmentation, and a tremendously high cost of innovation. So quickly going through it, the projects are hard to discover. So it's very difficult to see who's working on what across the geography. Second, there's over 150 altcoins. There's a lot of fragmentation in the ecosystem, which is really unfortunate. And third, it costs millions of dollars to get even the most trivial things done. And so these are really the symptoms of a disease, and the disease is a lack of a foundation. And so Ethereum, in essence, is an attempt to build a featureless foundation for innovation. So everybody can build on top of it. So what we're doing is taking a Turing complete scripting language and we're taking a blockchain uh, and marrying them together in a very unique way with this mechanism called a contract. And then we're going to build a reference client that sits on top of it, which essentially becomes the Android of the cryptocurrency space. It has a beautiful large application catalog and everything is one click installation. So you want a wallet, one click installation. You want bit message, one click installation. And we're going to open this up so everybody can use our APIs. They can use common programming practices to write their own applications for the catalog. And we're going to resolve those three problems because now we have a central, uh, well, I guess it's a decentral central app catalog that you know where all the innovation is. All the, excuse me, you know where all the, you resolve the isolation in a sense because you can see all the projects in a, in a single location. You can search and find them. Second, the apps now talk to each other through our compatibility layer. So in, you don't have to build BitMessage every time you need BitMessage functionality in your product. You can just simply talk to BitMessage through our foundation. And third, because we have a common application framework with these wonderful, really magical developer tools, uh, you're going to be able to develop things like MasterCoin in two months for fifty, sixty thousand dollars on top of the platform. You know, it's not something that requires large scale engineering because it's really from the very beginning a platform built for innovation instead of something where we kind of after the fact have to figure it out. So when Charles says a Turing complete blockchain, Vitalik, what does he mean by that? Okay, so Turing completeness says there's like there's this idea that you can create a programming language and once that programming language has at least a certain threshold of features, then it becomes as powerful as any other programming language that you can possibly conceive. Turing complete programming language can be used to, to perform any computation that can be mathematically defined. So the idea there is that this is a discovery made in computer science way back in the 1930s. Instead of having like spe- uh, specialized modules to performing specific tasks, you can have one Turing complete programming language, and then you can have computational modules dedicated to executing that programming language. And on top of that programming language, you can build all your applications. 
Imagine if we didn't have that, then today we might end up with, with computers that had a, a hardware module for Solitaire, a hardware module for Internet Explorer, a hardware module for World of Warcraft. That's kind of silly, isn't it? And basically yeah. the notion is if you can dream it, you can build it. Yeah. But well, why do we need Ethereum for this? Isn't this something that we could just put into Bitcoin or do it with another coin? No, it would require significant changes to the way the protocol works. And actually to understand the reason why, it's useful to understand the history of Bitcoin, where, where the movement came from. So back in 2009, 2008, Satoshi Nakamoto really wanted to test two things. And there was three things he could have tested, but he wanted to test two at the very least. He wanted to test this idea of a decentralized database. Basically, a ledger where you could put information into it, and you can't take it out. It's completely immutable. It's very secure, and it's totally transparent. This is the idea of the blockchain. Second, he wanted to test a transaction system. He says, well, you know, now that I have this database with all these things I can't take out, let me be able to move positions from one person to another person with no counterparty risk. There's no chargebacks. Uh, you don't need any third parties for this transaction system. These things combined together actually make a very nice currency. But there's this third thing you could test, and he was aware of it, which is a Turing complete scripting system. The problem is, when one wants to embrace Turing completeness, it comes along with a cost, which are usually security implications, implications about bloat, a whole bunch of things. And when you're running an experiment that's already really pushing the edge, you don't want to invite those kinds of risks. Now, fast forward, we're about five years in the future. Uh, we've seen amazing innovation in this space. We've seen a lot of players really working hard. And we've gotten to the point where everybody agrees Turing completeness in, in some way is a good idea, whether you're open transactions, your Ripple, your MasterCoin. Everybody has their own ideas about how to do this. It seems to me the most logical place to use it is on a separate blockchain structure so that we can preserve and protect the value of Bitcoin while we conduct this new experiment. And when we're talking about the blockchain, there's actually a proof of work that you're using called Dagger. Yes, that's correct. Uh, and it has some interesting characteristics and properties. It is directed at cyclic graphs. Dagger was designed to be a memory hard proof. So it's intended to be ASIC resistant by simply recognizing the economics of ASICs. It says if you build an ASIC for it, 90% uh, of the ASIC would be computer memory, which is already highly optimized. So basically a CPU system, a laptop with memory or a desktop with memory, would be the ideal miner, not, not a graphics card. Unfortunately, Dagger does have some issues with its ASIC resistance. While it is cryptographically secure, it uses the same SHA capping mechanism that uh, Bitcoin uses. Actually, improve one because we're using SHA-3. Dagger does have a problem with shared memory. So it can't be used with the property of ASIC resistance in its current implementation. And that's actually okay for us because we went to the drawing board. We talked to a lot of people in the community from some good crypt cryptographers to other people. And we came up with a pretty good plan. So moving forward into the future, uh, after we've cleared the fundraiser, what we're planning on doing is holding an academic contest where we're going to, uh, inspired basically by AES, it's really useful to examine AES, and we're kind of taking a lot of inspiration from that. Basically, the federal government paid IBM and a few other contractors a boatload of money to develop DES in the 70s. And unfortunately, DES had some issues with its implementation. So learning from that experience and seeing the pains that it caused the industry, NIST and others really wanted to take their game up a notch. And so they created a large circle of academic partners. They worked very hard with them and created a competition where they invited the best and the brightest mathematicians and cryptographers in the world and computer scientists in the world to participate. So we had Ron Reves, Bruce Schneier competed, uh, many teams. And eventually Reindell went out and became AES. So we looked at that and we saw the value gained from competition and the, and the value gained from collaboration. And we said we could certainly fix Dagger, but it said it's a much better idea to take the notion of a proof of work, proof of stake hybrid and hold a competition with the same economic model that we have, the same linear inflation rate and all the parameters we desire, for example, either ASIC resistance or ASIC community, if that's possible, and get a wonderful team of judges selected from the uh, applied and theoretical space, both on the hardware and software side, and hold a large-scale competition with a fairly robust bounty to develop a replacement for Dagger. Why is it that it just can't be completely proof of stake? What, what is the desire of using proof of work at all? Well, okay, so there's this notion of equatability. So you're kind of trading demons when you go from proof of work to proof of stake. So when you're on a proof of work system, you're vulnerable to 51% attacks, and those attacks are enforced by he who owns the mining hardware. When you're in a proof of stake system, you're vulnerable to 51% attacks, and those are vulnerable to he who owns the currency. 
And if you look at distributions of currencies like Bitcoin and, and other such coins, you'll tend to see that it's quite oligarchical in a sense. A small group of people tend to control a large scale of the currency. If you're comfortable with that, proof of stake is actually a fairly good system. If you're not comfortable with the lack of equitability in the ecosystem, then you probably need to embrace some sort of other hybrid. And there's numerous other problems with proof of stake, like how do you distribute the money and, uh, and so forth. And I think Vitalik can elaborate further on this. Right. So the basic issue is, is that proof of work actually serves two functions. So the first function is securing the network, and the second function is providing an issuance mechanism. So the thing is, is that if you move to proof of stake, then you also lose the issuance mechanism. You have, you have the only way that you have of issuing new coins is to basically give them to existing stakeholders. And that's basically equivalence to having a currency that's highly deflationary. So for example, if you look at Peercoin, you know, Peercoin is a proof of stake coin. It follows that model. There is actually a blog post that was looking at the, some wealth distribution metrics for all of the coins, and pure coin is pretty much the most oligarchical of them all. Like, if we are going to be heavily reliant on proof of stake without a proof of work component, we will need to come up with some alternative mechanism of distributing the currency units in the long term. But I thought the thing that Ethereum did was it allowed miners to execute code on behalf of a user. Mm -hmm. So couldn't that be the mechanism by which they, you could distribute new currency issuance is essentially by the amount of code that you execute on behalf of the user yeah, rather so than just by mining like right. SHA-256 yeah. or so, SHA-3. Right. right, so theoretically that would be ideal. The problem is, is that how do you verify that the miner actually executed those computations as opposed to just pretending that he executed those computations and generating some random result? Right. The, po the point of a proof of work is that it's something that is beyond reproach. Once you've done it and broadcast it to the network, it it's verifiable. And it's done in a two-part way. You do a hard set of work to find an answer, and essentially like a lottery system. And once you've done it, it's easy to verify. So th there's no way of getting around that. You have to do the work. If we were to follow that kind of a model, uh, you would lose that property. Another thing about proof of stake that's interesting is that it is a good way of getting people who own currency to have a skin in the game for consensus mechanisms. And so that's a valuable property to explore and think about. But you have to be very careful about the equitability of your currency. You don't want to have a situation where you have a group of, say, five or ten people who own the bulk of your currency and therefore can uh, control the consensus. Uh, and with our model, we think that proof of stake has some pro uh, promise, but we don't think it's good for an issuance model. SHA-3 seems like a peculiar choice. I'm, I'm not a cryptographer, but it seems like the, the debate's always been between script and SHA-256. Why is it that you're mixing it up by going with a different algorithm? Well, okay, there's a couple of reasons. Um, number one, SHA-3 has a wonderful cryptographic primitive, the sponge construction, which is eventually going to be used to construct block ciphers and new random number generators. So it's a beautiful construction just by itself. I think it's revolutionary as the Feistel circuit. Um, second, SHA-3 is going to eventually work its way into essential ASICs and CPUs, both on the ARM side, the Intel side, and the AMD side. They, there's this idea of specialized crypto cores. And we've already seen them with uh, AES, for example. So it's nice to say, hey, your CPU already has a built-in advantage that you know, your, shell, your cell phone has, your desktop has, and so forth. Also, it just seems to be cleaner in the way that we've designed things to embrace the newest standard, especially since the standard has been significantly vetted. NIST has gone through it, and many other agencies have gone through it. You were involved with Invictus Innovations. And that's correct. And they, too, have a memory-hard algorithm. Yeah, and there are some issues. It's uh, called momentum, but they're, they're moving away from that to a proof-of-stake system. So wh why is it that we need to decentralize mining to CPUs? I don't understand. I thought the whole argument with ASICs was just let it happen because it's a transitionary phase, and then eventually everyone will have it, and then the effect of ASICs will just be gone. Well, there's a couple of reasons why ASICs cause problems in the ecosystem, and some of them are problems of taste, and the other ones are problems of regulation. So the problems of taste are if you're okay with only a small group of people having access to the hardware and only a small group of people ever being able to run large ASIC pools, 
you know, if you're okay with that, then that's not a problem. But if you're not okay with that, then that is a problem because that's the inevitable momentum right. of ASICs but, in but general. But with CPUs, can't you just do that with botnets? Well, sure, you can do that with botnets, but everybody has a laptop, everybody has a desktop. You never have to buy anything. So everybody, if they wanted to build a large-scale mining pool, I can just go buy server blades. I don't have to wait for a pre-order from Butterfly Labs or wait for another uh, KNC miner to come. It takes time to get these devices, and the people who get first access to them are not everyday consumers. They're not well distributed. The people who get access to them are the people closest to the companies and the people closest to the pools, okay? And so from that kind of a perspective, that's fine. It's a commodity business. But honestly, it seems to me if you want to have the freest and fairest distribution of hardware, you go with something that is the most distributed. In this case, the CPU. It is the most distributed platform. Second is a problem of regulation. So imagine if you had two lists, a black list and a white list. Okay, and imagine if the maintainer of the blacklist and the whitelist went to the ASIC manufacturers and said, okay, I'm going to go ahead and create a protocol where an ASIC miner won't process transactions that have touched things that are on a blacklist, so a tainted coin in essence. You couldn't possibly do this with Intel or AMD or ARM. It, they're not going to modify their architecture to placate the will of, uh, of an actor. But for ASIC manufacturers, they're quite small, they're very boutique hardware, their market capitalizations are, are not so robust. They can be compelled to do this if desired. Now, some will cooperate, some are not. But the point is, because the hash power is now centralized to a small group of people, this could happen within a three to five year spread. And then you'd have a situation where you can have your Bitcoin, you just can't send them anywhere. They can't be sent through transactions. So that's an example of a blacklist attack that could be possible or engineered in a very creative way with, uh, with ASICs. So, right, but I mean, centralization with CPU mining always happens because they always move to GPU mining. They always move no, to. No, they can't. Technically, it's very difficult to move to a GPU space. One, because the processing cores themselves are slower. Second, because the, the memory space is smaller. So, you know, GPUs don't have 32 gigabytes of RAM. I mean, a lot of desktops do. Earlier today, we had one of the founders of Litecoin who was here. Yeah. And, you know, Litecoin was created specifically to give CPU mining back to people who right. were overcrowded by GPU mining. And right. the thought was, it's unasickable. It's unasickable. Well, no, you, you don't say that. So, there's the notion of ASIC resistance, and then it's a basically a, a war game between algorithm designers and the intention of the original proof of work system. Uh, then there's ASIC immunity, where there's structural features that make it physically impossible to develop ASIC. You can pursue ASIC resistance, and the designers of Script did, and for a time it worked well, and now people have discovered ways of using Script on GPUs quite efficiently. And that's just the nature of the business. How you is know, that not going to be the case with Ethereum? As I said, we're going to have a very robust competition to build a very good proof of work that's going to exhibit characteristics of ASIC resistance. Now, you're absolutely right. It perhaps could be the case that somebody develops a GPU algorithm and finds a way to enjoy mass concurrency. That's fine, because GPUs are still well distributed. I can buy them on Newegg or now on, with Bitcoin on Tiger Direct. So that's a good thing for consumers. I, I don't have to wait for six months for my GPU pre-order. Also, GPU manufacturers are not going to change their architecture to placate generic attacks on the system. CryptoKit is the world's first Chrome browser Bitcoin wallet. It's the easiest, fastest Bitcoin wallet payment system. With a simple one-click install, it takes just seconds to get your wallet set up. And because CryptoKit finds the address and payment for you, there's no more fussing around or tab switching. CryptoKit is more than just a wallet. It comes with a preloaded PGP encrypted social network, news feeds from Reddit and Google, and up-to-date charts from exchanges. Finally, CryptoKit directory allows you to make two-click payments with any of the BitPay merchants. Once you install CryptoKit, you won't need anything else. For more information or to download CryptoKit, visit CryptoKit.com. 